Good evening, everyone. My name is Don. I'm one of your pastors here at Legacy. Thank you for coming out this evening and joining together as we continue in our Lenten study. We are midway through the Lent journey this season. Uh, we journeying through this uh, tree series. Uh, trees have been such a powerful uh, part in many of our scriptures that we've been looking at. From the tree of life in the Garden of Eden to the to Jesus and the tree of Calvary. From the tree, <clears throat> excuse me, these trees serve as reminders for us still today in so many ways of just who God is and how much He cares for all that He has created. It is amazing to me to see how God cares and loves and provides for each and every one of us from the very beginning of our Bibles to the very end. It has been interesting to me to see all the major characters in our Bible and how they are associated in so many ways to trees or a branch, a, uh, a stick. And today in our passage we see a root, not Groot, a root. <clears throat> if you listen to Andy's sermon last week, you'll understand. Today we look at Joseph. There's a very important figure in the Old Testament. Joseph uh, enters the picture and was born around Genesis 30 uh, in the Old Testament. He comes a very active part of the story around Genesis uh, 39 or 37, rather. Uh, Joseph is the son of Jacob and Rachel. Uh, he is the uh, he has eleven brothers, and we know of at least one uh, sister. Excuse me. Uh, he is Rachel's firstborn son, but he is Jacob's eleventh son. Joseph uh, is Jacob's favorite child, and Jacob uh, has no problem in letting everyone else in the family know this. Um, Joseph didn't doesn't help his situation a whole lot. Uh, he is, I don't know if it's really arrogance or just being young and naive, uh, but he often spoke of things, dreams uh, that he had, and maybe he should have just kept his mouth shut a little bit until he understood a little bit better what these things meant. But Scripture tells us that Joseph's brothers could not say a peaceful thing about him. They could not speak a kind word to him. I have very few siblings, and they often didn't say nice things about me. I couldn't imagine 11 of them, but that was way before I knew Jesus, so that doesn't matter. <laughs> Eventually, his brothers, though, had had enough, and they plotted to kill him. But instead, they decided they, were, they would sell him uh, into slavery to a merchant caravan that was going to Egypt. So in Egypt, he ends up becoming a personal servant to Potiphar, and Potiphar is a captain of Pharaoh's guard. And Joseph does such a great job that soon he becomes the personal servant to Potiphar. And, and he becomes the superintendent to his whole household. Things are going great. Things are good. But then eventually he gets accused of inappropriate behavior with Potiphar's wife. And he's quickly thrown into prison. Through a series of events in prison... Uh, he's put in charge of all the prisoners. Again, he's doing great there. He's put in charge of all the, all the prisoners there. Well, Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker, they do something wrong, and, and Pharaoh doesn't like it, so he throws them into prison, and Joseph is put in charge of them. Now, these are two very important people to Pharaoh because poisoning is a big way of killing people in, in, in high places during that time. So having... Uh, trust among these two is, is very important, but they kicked off Pharaoh, so they're kicked into prison. Well, one night, these two start having these crazy dreams, and no one could tell them what they meant. God helps Joseph out. He helps him interpret these dreams. He tells the cupbearer what the dream meant, and that in three days, he would be in, restored to his position in Pharaoh's um, castle, or in his thing. <laughs> yeah, where he lives. I don't know. Words are hard. It's been a long day, people. 
But he would be restored to his position. He would be able to go home. But Joseph tells the cupper, he goes, look, I helped you out here. When you get back into Pharaoh's good graces, remember me, okay? Remember me. Help me out here. Then Joseph tells the, the baker what his dream meant. Not so good happy news for the, the baker. He said, in three days, you're going to hang. The, cup, the baker, he's, that's good news for you, not so good news. I'm sure the, the baker is probably wishing he didn't know what his dream meant. Maybe that's not a good thing to know what's going to come. Well, in three days, everything happened, just as, just as Joseph interpreted. The, the cupbearer goes back to his job, and the, and the baker is no more. But the cupbearer forgets. He forgets what he promised to do, and Joseph remains in prison. Then two years later, two years pass, <clears throat> Pharaoh starts having these nasty dreams, these terrible nightmares, and no one can help him. No one can interpret his dream. Finally, finally, the, the uh, cupbearer remembers. He remembers what had happened, and he goes to Pharaoh. He goes, oh, yeah, by the way, there's this Hebrew guy in prison who really helped me out when I was there. I bet he can help you, too. So Joseph is called to help out Pharaoh, and he does. He tells Pharaoh what the dreams mean, what is going to go on. God blesses Joseph again with that ability to tell Pharaoh what is going on and ends up saving Egypt. He tells Pharaoh his dreams mean that there's going to be seven years of great prosperity in Egypt, and that's going to be followed by seven years of terrible, terrible drought and devastation. Great famine. And because he's advised Pharaoh on, all, Pharaoh on all of this, they're able to start stockpiling during these great years, during this great, these great years of abundance. And because of this, Pharaoh, he puts Joseph in charge, and he gives him a position that is almost equal to his own. Puts him in charge of all the surplus and handing that out during the years that are not good in the land. The, the years that are destitute. And as the years go by, a few years later, Joseph comes face to face, face to face once again with his brothers. But his brothers don't even recognize him. There are so many emotions that are involved here. Being a slave, being put in prison, being away from his father. I can't imagine what's really going through Joseph's head here. But in the end, Joseph settles on forgiveness. Even to the point that after their father Jacob dies, his brothers again are fearful. They're afraid of what Joseph will do if that hatred would come and show itself and he would get even with them for all the things he does that they did to him that set his life into motion. But Joseph said to them, he said, do not fear. What you meant for evil against me, God used for good. He chose, he chose to comfort them. He chose to comfort them and spoke kindly to them. Our scripture passage today is found in Genesis 49. Jacob is giving his final farewell to his children. He is on his deathbed. And he's starting with the oldest and he works his way down through all the children. And he gets to Joseph. We'll start with verse 22. Jacob says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by the spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attack him, shoot at him, harass him severely. But his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the, of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd and the stone of Israel. Now, just in case you think I've been lo I'm losing my mind, and depending on what version of Bible you might be using or verbal, verbal? Bible app you're using, um, the, the text I read from you is from the ESV. If you're using like the NLT, it might read, Joseph is a wild donkey, a wild donkey beside springs, a uh, wild colt beside the wall. And I think the ECB says a young bull. Um, whatever, uh, it's all okay. Okay, translating from original Hebrew to English words sometimes gets hard. Um, it's just important to remember the meaning here is the same. 
Um, I want, and I want to draw your attention here to, to verse 23. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. The King James Version says it's a little, a little harsher. It says the archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. Words and actions can be like arrows that are, that are shot at us which are intended to hurt and sometimes even kill. Joseph here was not literally shot at or attacked by archers, but the wounds that he suffered went deeper than arrows probably ever could. Some wounds are so severe, so deep, we carry them all of our lives. Some scars are very noticeable, and they are very predominant in a person's life. But there is another truth that can come into play here. There are some, there are others who, who can have that same uh, type of injury, those same scars, um, but have made it different in their life. For them, today they are different people because of it. Some people can have scars and you don't even know that they are there. You can know them for many years and you don't know that that history and that battle scar remains with them. They've taken that injury and they've used it to become a better, a different person because of it. We have the, that ability with God's help to determine how uh, visible and how pronounced our wounds, inflict, the wounds inflicted on us by the archers will be. We can let what others and life has thrown at us to dictate our actions, attitudes, and livelihood, or we can own who we are and become more, become better, become stronger because of it. Joseph tells us, Joseph tells us, or Joseph, Scripture tells us, was sorely grieved by the archers, meaning his brothers, the, the lies and the, the broken promises but the record of his life makes it very clear that, that the wounds others inflicted on him were not the dominant aspect of his personality. Joseph was unshakable. His faith was unshakable. The God who takes the, the worst things in our lives and uses it for his glory, for his good work. But this type of faith does not come out on its own. It takes work on our part. It takes a person wanting to be more, to know and to trust the God who promises to never be anywhere but with us, to always be there. It takes work to live in a way that strengthens our relationship with God. Psalms 1, starting with verse 1. Oh, the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. Joseph is a great example of this psalm. The roller coaster of his life, from family to slave, head of household to prisoner, from prisoner or from leader in prison to leader in Pharaoh's kingdom. Faithfulness remains through all the struggles, through, through all the disappointment, through, through all the questioning why. Growing deep roots in our lives help grow branches that are able to bend but not break. Psalms 1 gives us practical steps to, to strengthen and build strong and healthy roots, and these practices we still use today. First, we have to ask ourselves, whose people are we with? The Psalms begin by telling us where God's people should not be. We should not take advice from the wicked, stand with sinners, or join with mockers. 
It doesn't say we run from them or have nothing to do with them or throw stones at them. It says don't take advice from them. Don't join their cause. Don't join in their wicked ways. You know, there are many faith groups that believe that we should not have anything to do with non-believers, have nothing to do with people who don't believe the way that we believe. Some go as far as to say if they're not even the same denomination as you, you should have nothing to do with them. That is not what Psalms 1 is telling us. I don't think that's in Scripture at all. And I, that is not what Jesus Christ said or demonstrated in any way during his time on earth. There is a big difference between, between being where non-believers are and being with them. We need, to be, we need to be where people need to hear about Jesus Christ. We do not need to be with them in their destructive behavior. There are instances where churches have acted uh, inappropriately, judgmentally, uh, painfully towards others, hypocritical. Our human nature then is to react by distancing ourselves from, from the church, separating ourselves from the institution of church altogether. But we cannot have a dynamic Christian or Christ-filled life and be separate from other Christians in fellowship and worship. We experience that riverbank, that water, that life of, in fellowship and in worship. If you've been hurt by the church, if you've been hurt by this church or any church, if you've been hurt by me, your pastor, or any of the pastors, give us a chance to make it right. I'm human. Believe it or not, I am human. I can make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. And I can say and do things that sometimes come across unintentionally hurtful. Let your pastors, let your church have the opportunity to, to correct that path. It is not in God's perfect plan for there to be any tension or discord, discourse within the church or within God's people. When we join together, we put down deep roots and, and help that help us survive in, in all kinds of situations and thrive in situations we never thought we ever could possibly get through. Faith development sharing and, and, and passionate worship are major uh, components in the type of Christian fellowship that we are, are called to be and called to have. Using our gifts and talents, serving others, is just one way of, of being able to soak up, soak up that water, that life-giving water from the rivers that flows from Christ. Here at Legacy, we call that radical hospitality, risk-taking missions and, and service. Millard Fuller, the founder of Habitat for Humanity, calls it the theology of the hammer. Spiritual personal growth takes place when we work to help others. The experience of our daily life can dry up, can dry us out unless we make it make the time to gather together with, our, with other faithful believers to ensure that the, our root system, our faith runs deep, stretches wide to reach out and give, to give us life, from, give us that life water from the riverbank. We are called to delight in God's word. God's People are to take delight in the law of the Lord. That's the word of God. And on God's love and to meditate on it day and night. There's a sect of the Jewish faith that take this, this literally and they clothe themselves with these little leather boxes and, that contain Hebrew texts. And they wear these in the morning to remind them during, during their morning prayer to remind them to keep the law of the Lord. 
You know, we stress that our children need to be educated and, and we make room in our schedules to, to take online classes or, or take classes at, at the co- local college to help out our career. You know, but why don't we consider, consider developing a deeper understanding, a deeper understanding of God or God's Word or our faith? We forget that we never stop learning as disciples of Christ. Study and fellowship with other believers can be an incredible way for us to grow and experience that abundant life that is ours in Jesus Christ. It is in that sharing of, that, of our experience that, that deepens and strengthens our roots. You and I can use personal devotional time in a way to delight in the word of the Lord and meditate on it. Find time every day to, to listen or read your Bibles, a devotion, and pray. It's just a vital way, vital part of our Christian life. After you read your Bible or listen to a devotional and pray, take some time to think about it, meditate on it. How does this apply to my life? How can I use this today? Who can I share this with? These things are all game changers. These all help us in our faith development. When we become passionate about God's Word, we can... Help, we can't help but see growth. It is important to notice how Christian growth takes place. It does not occur through an a accumulation of, of outside material things. We don't grow by making sure that everything in our lives is secure and, and in place and in order. Growth comes from within. God provides growth. When we have God's living water flowing through us, nurturing and sustaining us, we grow. We will grow in fruitfulness. We will will grow into that image of God. There are instances uh, of trees growing and thriving in places they never should be able to. Even when we feel like we are tipping off the edge, there are, circum- there are circumstances, decisions, and situations that come up, to, uh, come up or, or forced, uh, that are forced upon us that make us, wanna, that make us dig in, that dig in deep and, and hold tight to what we know to be true about our God. This picture is a frankincense tree on the edge of a cliff in Yemen. I don't see how we could dig in any deeper or hold on any tighter. Joseph's roots ran deep. He never lost faith. Not when he was sold into slavery, sent to prison, or forgotten about. Joseph could have easily gotten back at everyone who did him wrong. His brothers, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, the cupbearer who forgot about him in prison. But instead, Joseph repaid evil with goodness, murder with mercy, death with life. Joseph's faithfulness shows the proof of God's blessing and forgiveness. God always invites us to come to the water, to experience the life that is ours because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to grow into God's image. With deep roots, fruit, and leaf-bearing branches that never wither, and never bend or, or break down under the demands of this life. Roots grow down. Branches grow up. Faith grows down, grows deep, and blessings blessings grow up. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, help us to always, Lord, look for ways 
to draw closer to you. Lord, help us to find ways to draw closer to others around us. Help us to love, to care, and to forgive, Lord, the way you do. Lord, help us to always remember you are with us. Lord, give us that desire to set solid roots. Lord, that we know no matter where we are planted, in a steady field, next to a stream, or on the side of a cliff, Lord, that our roots are deep and that we are solid in our faith with you. Lord, we give you this day. Lord, we give it all to you. In your name we pray. Amen.